Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so uh, I'm a neuroscientist and a psychiatrist, uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the work uh, that we do in my lab. Uh, very basically, uh, we study the heart-brain connection and how that relates to this process called interoception. So uh, in my talk, uh, what I'm going to go over today is uh, give you an introduction to what is interoception? What's the history on it? I'm going to talk a little bit about the heart-brain connection and how uh, I studied that uh, in the past, uh, because I think it sets up very nicely uh, the studies that we're doing right now with the uh, float experience. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of our preliminary findings uh, that suggest perhaps floating may be a form of sensory enhancement. So. Uh, what is interoception? Uh, I don't know if it, uh, any of you have heard of that term before. Um, very basically, uh, you can think of it as how the brain senses the inner body. And we owe this uh, term uh, to uh, a gentleman by the name of Sir Charles Sherrington. He was a British physiologist. Uh, you can see, back in 1906, uh, he actually coined the term interoception. And he did this uh, because he was thinking about the nervous system. Uh, he actually won the Nobel Prize in 1936 for a lot of his work. Um, and one of the things, he was a very careful thinker, and one of the things that he uh, thought about was, you know, how do all the sensory signals that are available to the brain um, become received? And he sort of looked at the brain, and he looked at the body, and he sort of divided it up. So he talked about um, a process of extraception. So how uh, information from the external world gets in, lights, sounds, kind of how I'm seeing the audience now. He also talked about proprioception, so how information about the body and space gets received by the brain, kind of like how I'm moving my arms now. And then he talked about interoception, really how the brain senses the inner body. So. Uh, when you think about interoception more in a more detailed way, there's a lot of uh, systems or channels used by the brain uh, to sense the inner body. Okay? Uh, here's some examples. So we have the cardiovascular system, we have the respiratory system, gastrointestinal sensations, hunger, thirst, itch. There's a whole host of them, and you can see just from looking at them that they're very different. Uh, each of them have different types of sensory experiences associated with them. Uh, some of them seem more mechanical. Some of them, uh, like pH and glucose, are more chemical in nature. Uh, and you can even see that some of them uh, can have a component of pain. So angina is chest pain. Uh, that can be a signal of something like a heart attack. Uh, also, you can have non-painful cardiac sensations, palpitations. And sometimes that can be a sign of a cardiac injury. Uh, it can also be a, a sign uh, of another condition in psychiatry, like an anxiety disorder. Okay. Now, I'm showing you uh, all of these uh, sensory channels in a very clear way, as if uh, we can all feel these things uh, and, and report on them in a very uh, precise way. But the reality is, it kind of looks like this. So the brain receives all this information all at once, and is it really even a good idea for you to have awareness of all of these sensations at the time you're sitting here? right? Uh, we'd prefer that it looks sort of like this, right? Uh, but that's not actually the case, okay? Uh, and there are, are prominent reasons for that. Now, uh, the history of interoception research um, is actually a little bit varied. So uh, we surveyed recently uh, all the articles uh, on the topic of interoception that have been published, uh, and this is what we found. So basically, since Sherrington coined the term, there was kind of a dead zone for a while. Uh, and then there was some fluctuation and some interest uh, in the middle part of the latter century, a little bit of an increase. But what you can see is right now, we're currently undergoing an explosion of interest in this research area. 
I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about one study in particular that I've done uh, for a couple reasons. One is that it sets up very nicely uh, the approach to uh, studying flotation and also the way that I think about it, uh, but also because it illustrates uh, something very nicely in terms of where I did my training with Daniel Trinnell uh, and also the collaborators that I've had over the years. And uh, Justin has been one of the uh, uh, rock steady collaborators in this effort. So, so how do we study uh, uh, the heart-brain connection? I talked with you about uh, heartbeat sensations as one example. Uh, I gave you some examples where the heartbeat sensation was very prominent. Um, and for a variety of reasons, some of which I'll explain later on in my talk, um, we use a method where we can provide uh, uh, experience that's, uh, of heartbeat sensations that's fairly prominent. Um, as I said, I'm a physician, and so uh, we have the ability to use a very potent uh, medicine called isoproteranol. Now, isoproteranol, uh, even though it's a weird-looking word, uh, is something that you all intuitively uh, have experienced in one way or another because it's a fast-acting medicine uh, that stimulates receptors on the heart and in the lungs that uh, are activated by uh, epinephrine or adrenaline, as it's known. So if you think about times in your life where you felt your adrenaline going, that's kind of what isoproteranol feels like. The nice thing about it is uh, that you have a lot of experimental control. And in, in science, like I said, with those spaghetti plots, we really want to be able to systematically narrow down and study each channel of interoception uh, very discreetly. So this is how we did it in the past. Uh, I developed a method where uh, we infuse uh, isoproteranol intravenously. Um, here you can see at time zero, so that's when the infusion starts. Um, and this is about a two-minute window here. And you can see that on the y-axis we have the heart rate. Uh, and the normal heart rate ranges between 60 and 100 beats a minute. This solid black line here, just that's the only one to pay attention to really, is the heart rate response. And you can see that after you infuse a very low dose of this medicine, not much changes in the heart rate. Now, when you increase the dose, what you can see is that the heart rate response reliably increases, okay? Now, the way that we study interoception in this uh, context of heartbeat sensations, it may not come through very clearly here, but there's a little dashed line that I want you to look at now, okay? Now, this line is a dial that individuals turn to rate their experience of their heartbeat sensations in real time. So they turn the dial up if they notice an increase in the sensation. Um, the amount of the increase gives you a measure of the intensity of the sensation. And then what you can see is that at increasing doses, there seems to be a relationship between the heart rate response and the dial response, okay? Uh, and that can be quantified. So in this particular study, our hypothesis really uh, is that interoceptive awareness of heartbeat sensations uh, is mediated by a pathway leading to a brain structure called the insular cortex. Um, I'm not going to describe the insular cortex in great detail other than to say that uh, it is the most prominent area that we think uh, represents internal body sensations. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Kyle Simmons, is going to give a, a his talk next, and he'll go into that in much more detail, so you'll really have a full uh, understanding. But for this study, we thought uh, that uh, at this point, the insula was probably the most uh, responsible region of the brain for feeling uh, internal sensations of the heartbeat. And so uh, what we decided to do uh, was to study that pathway, um, study somebody who had uh, experienced uh, injury uh, to that pathway. Okay? Uh, and the way we did that was we studied uh, a very rare patient with a form of neurological injury the patient's name was Roger, uh, and he uh, acquired a, a viral infection in the 1980s, early 1980s. This was uh, before some of the later antiviral medications had developed, and the virus that he contracted was a herpes encephalitis virus. And in a subset of patients, that virus uh, can cross the blood-brain barrier and it can actually damage the brain. Now, what was very interesting about Roger is that uh, it damaged a variety of areas, but most notably for us, given our interest in research, this is where the insula would be, and what you can see is that it's almost completely gone on both sides of the brain, okay? 
So it really provided a unique opportunity um, to conclusively study uh, what happens in a, a person who doesn't have an insulin. How do they feel their heartbeat sensations? Okay. So to do that, uh, we brought Roger in, um, and we gave him isoproteranol uh, and some healthy uh, participants who consented to the research. And this is what we found, essentially showing that uh, as we gave increasing doses, uh, this is actually twice the dose of the highest one that I showed you before. Uh, these are the most common ranges of doses that have been used in this kind of research, uh, which has gone on in human participants safely for over 40 years. So it's not like we were taking something new uh, or make, uh, applying this uh, method in a new way. This has been around for 40 years. And what you can see is that Roger's heart rate response uh, is entirely in line with uh, the healthy participants who were matched in terms of age, in terms of gender and body mass index. So what did we find? Well, on the basis of this hypothesis that we have, we predicted that uh, if the insula really is necessary for the ability to feel heartbeat sensations, he really should not uh, have an increase in sensation of the heartbeat. Uh, so when we gave him the medicine, we actually looked, I'm going to show you now the highest dose. So this is a little complicated, but let me show you. So this is time. So the infusion started right here. And here's the heart rate increase during the infusion. This uh, light blue is the healthy compa uh, comparison participants. You can see their heart rates increased. You can see in this green, Roger's heart rate increased. And what you can see in, for the healthy participants is they have an increase in their dial ratings that's consistent with the increase in the heart rate. And what jumps out at you, uh, is, is, at me, is sort of two things. One is that um, Roger's heart rate response seems to be delayed, so it's a bit abnormal, but if you look at sort of relate in relation to the healthy comparisons, it's, it's pretty equivalent. So this was surprising uh, and very unexpected. Okay? I mentioned before uh, that we could um, calculate Roger's uh, accuracy uh, with how he uh, experienced heartbeat sensations. So this is if you uh, calculate what's called a cross-correlation between the dial and the heart rate. And when we did that with Roger, across a variety of different measures, which I won't bore you with the details, suffice to say that Roger was within the normal range on everything except for that time measure. Okay? Again, unexpected. One of the things that we're very interested in is uh, what are the pathways by which uh, the, the brain receives information from the heart? And given this finding where Roger clearly had some ability to feel his heartbeat sensations, we were wondering what could explain that, okay? So we asked him where he felt his heartbeat, and this is a, a cardiac body map. So these are the healthy comparisons. The brighter color here means that uh, larger numbers of healthy comparisons felt the heartbeat sensation. You can see that Roger felt it in about the same location. Okay. So we wondered, well, can we maybe do something, if that's where the sensation is, can we do something to attenuate uh, that pathway? So the idea was maybe there's something in the skin um, that is helping Roger feel his heartbeat sensation. So this led to consideration of another hypothesis, basically, the interoceptive awareness of heartbeat sensations is mediated by two pathways, one projecting to the insula and another projecting to another body-sensitive brain region that's well-known and well-characterized that represents information from the skin, the somatosensory pathway. So the idea was uh, what happens if both of those pathways are injured uh, or attenuated, I should say, not injured. So uh, in this follow-up, what we did is we studied uh, Roger's uh, feeling of his heartbeat again, but this time, uh, both for him and the healthy comparison participants, uh, we applied a, a topical anesthetic cream, like a lidocaine cream, to the surface of the chest to see if uh, attenuating skin sensation in the chest would have an effect on heartbeat sensation. And here's what we found. Anybody see any differences? So. Here we have the healthy comparison's heart rate response. Here we have their dial rating, very consistent with before. Here we have Roger's heart rate response, consistent with the comparison participants. And here's his dial rating.
completely absent. He was told specifically, turn the dial up if you notice an increase in your heartbeat sensations. Now, maybe he fell asleep, right? That's certainly quite possible. So what we did was we asked him, uh, and all I will say is, I'm going to skip this, suffice to say that Roger uh, was able to verbalize an experience of his heartbeat sensations, uh, uh, and he did not have an experience of his heartbeat, and this stood in contrast with our comparison participants. Okay? So this study uh, provided some conclusions. One is that there's multiple pathways in the body, um, and... Uh, those multiple pathways can be utilized by the brain to receive information uh, about the heart. And there's perhaps an inner pathway and an outer pathway. Uh, in res with respect to this outer pathway, it seems that the skin, which is a surface organ, uh, is something that can communicate information about the heartbeat to the brain. Uh, and finally, uh, one of the questions that we can't really uh, address with this is whether or not uh, there was some form of compensation in Roger. So he had this viral injury uh, to his brain, and it's possible that maybe he really couldn't feel his heartbeat sensations at all in the immediate aftermath, but we know that there's a lot of plasticity in the brain, and we know there's reorganization following brain injury, so perhaps it's possible that uh, the skin pathway is a compensatory one. We don't have the ability to make that conclusion with this study. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about why study floating. I think you may have seen this uh, slide from Justin in previous years. Um, the idea is that if you think about neuroanatomically what floating uh, the experience is like, you have uh, the attenuation or reduction of various uh, extraceptive and proprioceptive sensory signals that the body uh, is transmitting and that the brain is receiving. Okay? So this is not a lesion pathway per se. This is not uh, something that... Uh, it reflects uh, a, a pathological alteration, but it represents a sort of shift uh, in the balance of these signals uh, that um, I think is interesting and worth studying. So the basic hypothesis that we have right now is that floating enhances interoception. Okay? So um, this uh, is uh, related to what some people prominently report in the float experience. Um, and one of our thoughts, uh, which is a secondary hypothesis, is that uh, perhaps altering the balance of input uh, between interoceptive, proprioceptive, and uh, extraceptive uh, signals reaching the brain uh, is responsible. So I'm going to do a little demonstration, and then I'll get to the uh, float results, uh, which I'm sure you've all been waiting for. <laughs> so um, the first question I have for people is just a show of hands. Um, how many of you have had a prominent experience uh, of your heartbeat sensations uh, while you were floating? Just raise your hands for me. Okay. I think almost everybody. I think that's about 90%. Okay. All right. So we're going to uh, do a little exercise together. So what I'd like you to do is with your eyes open um, and uh, seated in a comfortable position, uh, just pay attention to the feeling of your heartbeat right now. Okay. So um, when you're ready, go ahead. And just notice the feeling. Okay. Next thing that I'd like you to do is, again, pay attention to your heartbeat. But this time, every time you feel it, I want you to silently count the number of beats that you feel. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, the next thing that I'd like you to do is pay attention to the heartbeat. And instead of counting silently, every time you feel a heartbeat, just tap your finger on your thigh. Go ahead. Okay. Next, we're going to uh, uh, imagine a different scenario. So. Now imagine you have, you're in a room and you have either some headphones or you have access to a speaker. And um, what is going to happen is you're going to hear tones through the speaker and you're going to have a number of trials. And in some of the trials, um, you'll, you'll hear a tone in all of the trials. Uh, and in the first, in one set of trials, the tone happens at the same time as your heartbeat. 
So uh, what I would uh, ask you to imagine is if you just look at my hand and imagine that my hand is your heartbeat, and the heartbeat goes like this. Okay? So in half the trials, the tone is going to happen at the same time as the heartbeat, just like this. Beep, 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 beep. Okay? In the other half of the trials, uh, the tone is going to be slightly delayed from your heartbeat. So your heartbeat's going along, but the tone is a little delayed. So beep, beep, beep. Okay? And what I'm going to ask you to do in that type of situation would be to pay attention to the heartbeat sensation that you feel and compare the sensation to the tones and tell me yes or no whether or not your heartbeat sensation is happening at the same time as the tones or at a different time. Okay? Now, uh, in this particular scenario, I can, uh, I can give you uh, the tones that half the time occur at the same time as your heartbeat, half the times at another time, and uh, we can do it a bunch of times. So, for example, you would, if you were right, we did 50 trials and you were right 40 of those times, that would be kind of like calling black uh, 40 out of 50 times in the roulette table in Vegas, and you would probably head straight to Vegas and start gambling. Okay, so you, you, could, you can evaluate on an individual level how well somebody can feel their heartbeat sensation. The question is, how easy was that? Okay. And finally, uh, you can also modulate the heartbeat. So uh, what I'd like you to think about is just how easy is it? Well, using that sort of very complicated uh, and onerous tone task, turns out most people can't even feel their heartbeat um, when they're at rest. Uh, the average is about 34%. Uh, this is true uh, in a study we did with experienced uh, meditation practitioners from multiple traditions. And what's interesting with respect to um, pathways is that even heart transplant patients who've had somebody else's heart inserted in their body uh, to save their life and to preserve function, they feel their heart beat at about the same rate. Now, everything that I just uh, ran you through are what I call the facets of uh, cardiac interoception, and that first task where you're just paying attention measures some of them. And you can see that when you counted, we we're measuring more. When you were tapping, even more. With heartbeat detection, we're getting more. And then finally, uh, the infusion uh, condition, where you can really evaluate all the facets. And it's one of the reasons I've used it. Uh, Kyle is going to talk about the uh, VIA, or visceral interoceptive, interoceptive attention task. It's a nice contrast. But the next question with floating really is, how does floating uh, alter the balance? Okay. So uh, the first set of results that I'm going to present um, relate to sessions one through three for the floating. Uh, and this was a condition where we had eight participants in the chair condition, uh, in the chair float, and eight participants in the pool float. Okay. And what we did is to look at interoceptive intensities, we just asked people after each float, how intensely did you notice things like your heartbeat sensations, your breathing sensations, um, your stomach sensations? And so here are our preliminary results. You can see that even after the first session, the group that is in the pool float has a much higher uh, experience of the breathing. And that's true across sessions one, two, and three. Uh, and in fact, the group effect is statistically significant, even in eight per group. What about heartbeat sensations? Well, a little bit of a different story here so far in this small sample. What we can see is that the intensity of heartbeat sensations is about even between the two groups until you get to the third float session. Now, this session is uh, going to be important for some of the neuroimaging data uh, that's going to be presented later on, because if you remember, in Justin's talk, he said that they were, people were scanned before the first session and after the third session. Okay? So we're interested in how uh, floating may enhance interoception. We have all these ways to measure it. What about cardiac body maps of the float experience? So this is the results for the uh, first three float sessions. So uh, what we call sort of the chair, chair, chair condition. This will be relevant in a little bit. So what this is, is the locations in the body where individuals who are in the zero gravity chair felt their heartbeat sensations intensely. 
Okay, the scale here can go from zero to 10 at a maximum. In this panel, what you see is the float condition. And immediately, what you kind of notice is that there seems to be a little bit more spread in where the float group is feeling heartbeat sensations with respect to the chair group. By the way, the uh, group by session interaction here is significant uh, for this comparison. So the take home message here is that floating may e increase uh, experiences of heartbeat sensations. Again, preliminary. For stomach sensation, this is what the data looks like. Uh, it's possible that there may be an effect, but uh, right now there's nothing that is statistically uh, significant. So I had you do uh, all of these different uh, ways of attending to your heartbeat sensations for a reason. And the reason is that uh, we're trying to figure out the best ways to measure people's ability to feel heartbeat sensations in a float pool. So we've been using the, most, the least restrictive and least invasive approach, just letting people float. So the first three floats might be considered equivalent to a float in any center in the country, just asking people after the fact what they feel. Um, but in an in a extension of this study, what we've been doing is looking at how people experience the heartbeat you know, when they count it. Okay? So uh, for this study, we have added a fourth and a fifth session. So uh, in the fourth session, uh, the group that is uh, in the pool goes pool, 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 pool. And then in the fifth session, they cross over into floating in a chair, zero gravity chair for the first time. And we do vice versa for the other group. And the idea here is because of the experimental control we have with the um, zero gravity comparator condition, we can really look very closely at the different factors in floating that might explain some of the differences in interoception experience. Okay. So this is just uh, to show you that people go from the, the pool to the chair and from the chair to the pool in what's called a crossover design. Okay. We measured heartbeat counting, so we had to do some very different things in order to get that heartbeat signal. So we used uh, uh, a wireless uh, measure of heart rate. We could continuously measure using something called a biopatch uh, from this company. There are many others like it on the market at this point. Um, and basically what we have people do is lie in the, here's the, an example in the, in the closed pool. Um, they have a, um, an ankle rest to keep it still, and um, they'll wear the bio patch here. Um, we have a tegaderm uh, that will keep it dry, and people count what they feel. And then we compare their report uh, to our uh, observation of the number of heartbeats. Okay. Now, uh, because we know a lot about the pathways by which the brain receives heartbeat information, and we've, I've already shown you that the skin uh, seems to play a role, um, we need to also have an additional uh, control. And this is um, something called, that I've called auditory contamination. So if you look at the ear, um, I don't know how many of you have had the experience of a long day of work, you lie down at night, you put your head on the pillow, and you hear your heartbeat. Or you go uh, and you put some earplugs on and you hear your heartbeat. You can even do it just putting your uh, ears over your head, over, uh, your hand over your ears. And <laughs> I don't know how you put your ears over your head, but <laughs> maybe another study. <laughs> so uh, what we know is that um, the middle ear has uh, two different arteries supplying it blood. They're called the anterior tympanic artery and the stapedial artery, they come off of different vessels. And the only reason I'm making this point is that they are right near the inner ear bones. And the transmission of sound waves vibrates the ear bones and that's what you hear. So um, we need to actually control for this. If you float in a pool and you have your head underwater or you have earplugs, you're gonna be able to hear that sensation, right? Um, and that's not necessarily what we're talking about when we uh, are hypothesizing that uh, floating uh, may improve interoception. So we need to control for that. So in this study, um, what we've done to eliminate that confound, we don't allow participants to use uh, earplugs or headphones, and we also keep their ears above the water using an inflatable pillow. And at this point, I don't have any statistical comparisons for this data set. 
Um, suffice to say that we are finding some differences, but they're not so far in the uh, direction that we would expect. So the hypothesis, if floating improves interoception, is that if you go, uh, as you have more exposure to float, so float, float, float in the pool, that uh, the accuracy here maybe would be higher than the accuracy of people in the chair float, and we don't actually see that. Um, again, it's a small data set. What we do see is that when you do the crossover, so the people who go from the chair, 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 chair to the pool for the first time, so this you could think of as, as somebody who has some experience with lying in a chair but not with floating, not really much of a change the very first time, whereas here, if you look at people who are uh, experienced in a pool and they go pool, 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 and then chair, you there's a difference in the rate of accuracy. It's not statistically significant, so we don't know much at this point. Uh, and I'm going to skip uh, some of the other uh, uh, maps uh, at this point. Uh, we see some interesting differences, but um, we're not exactly sure what they mean. So I'll give you an example. Uh, if you look at this chair, 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 chair group, when they go into the float condition, the intensity seems to be a, a little bit less when they go in the pool versus the float group who goes float, 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 float when they go in the chair. Some of this variation seems to drop away um, and there seems to be perhaps more intensity um, when they're in the chair. I have some thoughts about that, why that might be, but it's not a statistically significant finding at this point, so it's really just uh, on the basis of pure description that I'm showing this to you. So, in terms of preliminary conclusions, uh, at this point, uh, it seems that floating is showing some signs of augmenting uh, interoception. From my perspective, as a newcomer to this area, Justin mentioned that um, uh, I joined LIBOR recently, and that's true. Uh, I also floated uh, recently, maybe within the past year. Um, Based on the subjective experience that I had and that other people have, it seems to be a very unique environment. Um, and from the data that we have at this point, uh, it seems that continued research into the effect of floating uh, on interoception uh, is worthwhile. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist as well, and, and I have uh, a deep interest in uh, helping to bring uh, novel treatments um, that can help for uh, disorders that people suffer from. Uh, and uh, one of the ways to evaluate whether uh, a new therapy is useful is to use a clinical trial. Um, I think that uh, there are reasons why the float environment uh, may be useful uh, in conducting uh, a clinical trial. Certainly, I've heard a lot of anecdotal uh, reports uh, from uh, people who have floated, um, and I think the clinical trial framework is really the best way uh, to rigorously study and understand what the effects are of floating on health conditions. So to close my talk, I'd really like to acknowledge all of my collaborators, um, particularly Justin Feinstein, who's introduced me to floating, uh, as well as uh, a graduate student and postdoc uh, who worked very hard on helping to prepare some of this data. So uh, Jesse Shetler and Steve Green. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, my other collaborators, uh, Martin Paulus and Kyle Simmons, uh, and my support. And I look forward to meeting you at this conference and answering uh, questions after the talk. So I'm going to uh, ask uh, Kyle Simmons to come out next. He's going to talk about uh, a neuroanatomical model uh, and uh, of how the body, uh, uh, how the brain represents internal body sensations or interoception, uh, and how. Uh, uh, his theoretical perspective uh, brings to bear uh, on the, the float experience. Thank you very much.